All right, we are on chapter six of Michael Parenti's The Assassination of Julius Caesar, The People's History of Rome, Ancient Rome. So chapter six, The Face of Caesar. So here's the quote from Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene Two, Shakespeare. Caesar shall forth the things that threaten me never look but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are banished. Rome's greatest popular reed was Gaius Julius Caesar, known to his contemporaries as Gaius Caesar and to history as Julius Caesar. He was born in 100 BC, the scion of an old patrician family. His uncle by marriage was Gaius Marius, the famous popular reed, and his father-in-law was Marius' close ally, Cornelius Cinna. Being Marius' nephew and Cinna's son-in-law during Sulla's reign of repression in 82 placed young Caesar on the defeated side and slated him for proscription. Sulla announced his willingness to spare Caesar's life if the youth would pledge himself to the reactionary cause and to demonstrate the sincerity of his conversion. Caesar was expected to discard his wife Cornelia Cinna's daughter and marry someone chosen by Sulla. Had Caesar been driven primarily by unprincipled Ambition and a lust for power, as Cicero claimed and many Ciceronian historians insist to this day, he would have eagerly accepted this chance to be catapulted into the highest circles as the tyrant's protege. Instead, he spurned Sulla's offer, though mindful of the ruinous consequences showing great displeasure. Sulla ordered his arrest and stripped him of his inheritance and his wife's dowry. Some historians report that Caesar saved himself by taking flight after bribing one of Sulla's captains with a considerable sum of two talents, approximately 100 pounds of gold or silver. Others say he survived because Caesar's mother and conservative members of her family used their connections with well-placed Sullen partisans to prevail upon the tyrant to pardon the defiant youth. To those who advise Sulla against eliminating someone so young, he is quoted as saying, Bear in mind that the man you are so eager to save will one day deal the death blow to the aristocracy which you have joined me in upholding, for in this Caesar there is more than one Marius. For the next few years, Caesar kept a healthy distance from Rome while Sulla's prescriptions were claiming thousands of victims. In 78, news of Sulla's death brought him hastily back to the city. Caesar, the popular movement was servicing anew, even seeming to threaten social revolution. With desperate energy, the Senate aristocrats regrouped the Solon forces and granted plenary power to Pompey to repress the disturbances. At this time, Caesar refrained from entering the fray. In 75, Caesar journeyed abroad, most probably to claim a legacy from his deceased friend and former lover, King Nicomedes. On his way, the story goes, he was captured by pirates and held ransom for a huge sum of 50 talents. After weeks of effort, his envoys extracted this amount from the allied coastal municipalities. Many of the pirates were drawn from these same towns, since the inhabitants often shared in the spoils. It was established that they should be required to make restoration. Upon being released within the space of a day, Caesar armed some ships and recruited a band of irregulars, who perhaps belonged to a clan that was a rival of his erstwhile captors. His makeshift force surprised the brigands that evening and captured some of their ships. Caesar executed his former captors and pocketed the immense ransom for himself, presumably after paying off his hirelings. Even at this point, there still was nothing to prevent Julius Caesar from taking the well-paved path of an optimate career. He would have been welcomed into the oligarch, oligarchic camp with open arms and ready rewards. Instead, he moved in the opposite direction, exhibiting a dedication to the popular cause that captured the people's affection. In 73, he supported a measure that would allow the return of Promarius' political exiles banished during Sulla's reign. That same year, he sided with the interesting Democratic leader and tribune, Licinius Macer, in a campaign to undo the Sullen decrees that had abrogated the powers of the people's tribunate. It was Macer who helped create a democratic mode of public speaking utilized by Caesar himself, arming his listeners with factual evidence and precise argument rather than rolling over them with the oratun periods and histrionic locution of classical oratory. Cicero describes Maester as being of unimpressive presence. His looks and manner detracted from the effect of his intellectual prowess, yet he was effective enough. His language was not richly abundant, but neither was his meager. His voice, gestures, and delivery were entirely lacking in charm, yet his use of original material and his arrangement of what he had to say were so carefully thought out as to be 
unsurpassed by anyone else in these respects. All we have of Macer's words is a speech preserved in the surviving fragments of Salist history. Living under the Solent Constitution in the late 70s, Macer was fully cognizant of the dangerous power wielded by the oligarchs, a tribune such as himself alone and deficient in resources and with a mere empty semblance of office could not hope to challenge them without mass support. What an uproar they incite against myself, he remarked. Macer chastised the plebes for their lack of organized action and their willingness to lease themselves as clientele to aristocratic patrons. You act like a tame herd, notwithstanding your great numbers, allowing yourselves to be possessed and fleeced by the few. By obeying the lordly, by obeying the lordly commands of the consuls and the decrees of the Senate, the people fortified the very authority that oppressed them. If they did not struggle to regain their rights and defend their interests, they would only be subjected to still more severe injustices, he argued. Under the pretense of conducting war, the nobles grabbed control of the treasury and the army, Macer went on. They tricked the people into believing they are sovereign by waging raucous but vacuous political contests in which voters are allowed to select not their defenders but their masters. The populace, he argued, should not allow itself to be bribed with a meager grain disbursement that was not much more than prison rations. Even that paltry handout was grudgingly granted only out of fear of social unrest. Nasser called upon the plebes to withdraw their empowering responses by resisting military conscription and refraining from serving the rich. I do not recommend armed violence or a secession, but only that you should refuse to shed your blood in their behalf. Let those of us who have no share in the profits be free, also from dangers and toil. Macer's career illustrates how a popular leader can be immobilized short of assassination. In 66, while serving as a provincial governor, he was targeted by the optimates and charged with extortion. Presiding over his trial was Cicero himself, who gleefully wrote to Atticus, I gained more approval by his conviction than I would have gained from his gratitude if he had been acquitted. Fully expected to be found not guilty, Macer greeted the news of his conviction with utter dismay, retiring to his home where he either died of a heart attack or committed suicide. In 68, Julius Caesar delivered a public eulogy for his aunt Julia, wife to Marius, at whose funeral he boldly displayed images of Marius, something nobody had dared to do since the Solon reaction. In the ensuing years, Caesar went on to win various public offices. As a deal in 65, he used the money of rich associates to organize festivals and spectacles of, up, of unprecedented extravagance. And he won appreciation for the great care he gave to public squares and buildings and for restoring the Appian Way. He also ordered that under darkness images of Marius he placed in the capital. The next day, as word of this spread, Marius's party took courage, and it was incredible how numerous they were suddenly seen to be, and what a multitude of them appeared and came shouting into the capital, many extolling Caesar as the one man who was a relation worthy of Marius. In 64, when just 36 years old, Caesar presented himself as a candidate for high priest Pontifex Maximus, a lifelong prestigious position he occupied without benefit of any deep religious conviction. Plutarch reports that his election, won against two eminent older senators, excited among the Senate and nobility great alarm, lest he might not urge the people to every extreme of recklessness. Later that year, Caesar and others put together a land reform bill that was designed to be moderate in method, but comprehensive in scope. Allotments were to benefit both the landless poor and army veterans. The holdings would be acquired only from public lands and parcels purchased from landholders willing to sell. Land-rich nobles deeply in debt were guaranteed a good price despite depressed land values. Funds for the program would come from the sale of property and wealth confiscated from overseas dependencies, thereby costing the public treasury little, while finally providing a socially useful means for distributing war booty. On 1 January 63, the newly elected consul Cicero, in his inaugural address before the Senate and in two subsequent orations in the forum, through the full weight of his office against the land reform bill, misrepresenting its moderate contents and raising alarmist cries that the proposal was a plot against liberty, darkly engineered and full of secret purpose. Kahn notes that Cicero was equating change with subversion, depicting any measure to mitigate material misery as a lunge toward revolution. The bill was either withdrawn or defeated in, in an assembly vote. This setback must have taught Caesar something about the difficulties of peaceful reform within the existing system. Still, his own career moved forward. He was elected praetor in 62 and proconsul of farther Spain in 61, where he engaged in a victorious military campaign against the Lusitani, 
It was during these years that he forged political friendship with Crassus and Pompey. <clears throat> the ex praetor on Marcus Crassus, a former subordinate of Sulla, mentioned in the previous chapter as accused of participating in the Catiline plot, owed a celebrity to both money and military endeavor. He amassed vast amounts through investments, becoming a landowner and slumlord. His dubious claim to fame came in 71 BC when he headed the army that delivered the death blow to the great slave rebellion led by Spartacus. He hunted down and killed Spartacus and then crucified 6,000 of his men. Pompey also had be so was it when he headed the army that delivered the death blow to the great slave rebellion. Pompey also had begun his mili Pompey also had begun his military career as an ally of Sulla in 82 whom he served in outstanding fashion, winning the dictator's gratitude and admiration. Summoned back from Spain to help quell Spartacus's rebellion, Pompey arrived in time to partake in the final bloodletting, which he and his associates trumpeted as a major military success, eclipsing Crassus's endeavor, endeavors. Whatever clashes and feelings of rivalry they may have had, Crassus and Pompey managed to work together, getting themselves elected as consuls for 70 B.C., Pressured by popular agitation, they devoted their year in office to undoing some of Sulla's reactionary edicts. They encouraged the censors to expel 64 senators for gross corruption, and they supported a bill reducing senatorial membership on jury panels to one-third. Most important of all, a law proposed by Pompey lifted the restrictions Sulla had imposed upon the people's tribunes. These efforts won the applause of the people and the and the ur of the Senate and qualified Pompey as a popular re, at least for a spell. Through the 60s, Crassus associated himself with the popular cause, supporting Mason when he was hounded by the Optimates in 66, then serving as Caesar's financial backer. By this time, Pompey had won additional fame for his swift and successful campaign against the pirates who had been marauding the Mediterranean. In 60 BC, Caesar invited Crassus and Pompey to join with him in what became known to modern historians as the first triumvirate. triumvirate. Pompey had the prestige of a war hero and presumably the backing of his veterans. Crassus had the money and Caesar had the support of the plebes. Together they challenged the Optimates and merged for a time as the dominant political force, able to undo some of the more reactionary features of the Solon constitution, causing Cicero to denounce them privately as three immoderate men. <clears throat> In the face of heavy optimate opposition, Caesar won the supreme office of consul, serving in 59. Early in his consulship, he submitted another land reform bill accepted by Pompey and Crassus, not like the one proposed in 63. Cicero was invited to serve on the land reform commission, but refused. After the bill was filibustered to death in the Senate by Cato, Caesar applied the tactics of Gracchi, of the Gracchi, dealing no further with the Senate and turning to the popular assemblies to get the law passed. It was not long before Cicero was complaining that the land distribution program was taking away our rents in Campania. Caesar's, fellows, Caesar's fellow consul, Bibulus, the Optimate's man, opposed Caesar's reformist measures and tried to paralyze proceedings within the assemblies by forever citing bad omens. Whenever democratic sentiment gained a sufficient momentum and risked being thwarted by religious auspices, auspicia, that is, by divinations of the will of the gods, auspices were conducted by the College of Augurs, an exclusive aristocratic preserve until the beginning of the first century BC, after which notable equestrians were also inducted. By simply reporting unfavorable omens, the augurs could postpone action within the popular assemblies or invalidate the election of a pro-democratic official. It was customary to regard any sign from heaven as inauspicious and reason enough to suspend public proceedings. Divinations were issued after a ritualized study of the entrails of sacrificial animals or after observing a sudden flight of birds, a thunderstorm, a streak of light in the celestial firmament, or some other unusual, unusual happening. The ruling circles appreciated the conservative veto offered by the auspices. Cicero was explicit on this point. While he privately dismissed augury as nothing more than just so much mummery, he was all for using it as a state weapon against the frenzy of the tribunes and the unjust impetuosity of the people. A century before Cicero, Polybius commented on the political uses of religion. Superstition is actually the element that holds the Roman state together. 
as the masses are always fickle, filled with lawless desires, unreasoning anger, and violent passions. They can only be restrained by mysterious terrors or other dramatizations. Later on, Gibbon wrote, the various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. One modern-day conservative historian acknowledges that religious auspices auspices helped to keep things going as they had always gone and to teach the lower classes to know their proper place. So, it's, so it came as no surprise that Bibulus, having shut himself up in his house through most of his co-consulship, would attempt to trump Caesar in the popular assemblies by repeatedly announcing inauspicious augurs, ploys that Caesar simply ignored, just as he must have disregarded Bibulus's vetoes. Whatever his popularity, Caesar, Caesar still lacked the power and prestige of a military hero. Unlike Alexander, Hannibal, and Napoleon, he began his career as a politician rather than as a military leader. Originally intending in the manner of Pericles and Gaius Gracchus to attain his reforms without the use of force, he attended to the political arena for 18 years. Then at the age of 40, he became convinced that having an army at his back was a surer way when facing off against a death-dealing oligarchy. <clears throat> By that time, the Roman Republic ruled over a far-flung empire, extending across the entire Mediterranean basin from Spain to Asia Minor. Caesar added to its possessions and partook of its plunder and bloodletting. In 58, he, be in 58, he became proconsul, provincial governor of Cisalpine Gaul, northern Italy, and Transalpine Gaul, France, and Belgium. In a series of military campaigns that lasted for nine years, he brought all of Gaul under Roman Serenti, Suzerainty, along with portions of Germany. He continued as proconsul for five additional years under a law passed in 55 by, by Pompey and Crassus, who again were serving as consuls. The alliance between Pompey and Caesar had been cemented by Pompey's marriage to Caesar's daughter, Julia. But Julia died in 54 at a time when Pompey was becoming increasingly uneasy about Caesar's growing popularity and military strength. The following year, the triumvirate came to an end when Crassus suffered a disastrous military defeat in his campaign against the Parthians, or the Parthians, the Parthians in the east, present-day Iraq and northern Syria, and was then treacherously killed while attempting to negotiate with them. The Parthians knew something about Crassus. As Florus reports, they cut off his head and poured molten gold into his mouth that he whose mind had burned with desire of gold might, when dead and inanimate, and inanimate be burned with gold itself. The death of Crassus not only brought the collapse of the triumvirate, but spelled the beginning of civil war. According to the Roman historian Lucan, Caesar could no longer endure a superior nor Pompey an equal. Pompey, according to Dio, greatly displeased by the general praise bestowed upon Caesar, whereby his own exploits were being overshadowed. He attempted to persuade the consuls not to make public Caesar's letters, but to downplay his victories. He reproached the populace for paying little heed to himself and going frantic over Caesar. Sensing Pompey's discontent, the optimates sought to enlist him to their cause. They feared Caesar as a shrewder and more dedicated popularity of the two. Although he was away on his Gallic on his Gallic campaign through most of the 50s, Caesar still managed to keep a hand in Roman politics, acting through surrogates or himself, sometimes returning to Rome during the winter months. Pompey proved receptive to the Optimates' overtures. In 52, the senators designated him sole consul of Rome, in violation of constitutional practice that required two consuls to serve and both to be elected by the assemblies. About that time, they extended his command in Spain for another five years. With Julia dead, Pompey rejected an offer to marry Caesar's great niece and instead took the daughter of Metallus Scipio, a Senate Optimate. He then selected his newly acquired father-in-law to serve alongside him as fellow consul for the remaining months of 52. Another unconstitutional move that was perfectly acceptable to the senatorial constitutionalists. Highly influential aristocratic families such as the Metalli were willing to truck with Pompey at least until Caesar could be scotched. In the late December of 50, while Caesar was still in Gaul, the conflict between him and the Optimates came to a boil. The Senate decided that a successor should be sent to replace him. The Senate's order was vetoed by Curio, a tribune sympathetic to Caesar. Caesar's counteroffer put before the Senate by Curio was that both he and Pompey resigned their military commands. This proposal won enthusiastic support among the common people. By a vote of 
370 to 22, the senators readily approved this plan. It was a chance to avert civil war and disarm both Caesar and Pompey. But this was not good enough for the ultra-conservative optimists, hardened as they were against Caesar. They found a tribune who vetoed the mutual disarmament proposal. If Caesar resigned his command, they must have thought this would not end his political appeal. In any case, there would be little to prevent him from calling up his veterans or levying new recruits at some future flashpoint. The following day, one of the consuls, also of the conservative faction, called on Pompey to take command of two legions. Negotiations continued into early January 49. Acting not at all like someone lusty for kingly power, Caesar again proposed that he and Pompey resign their commands. His message was put before the Senate by a tribune and political ally, Mark Antony, who had succeeded Curio. This time the senators angrily rejected it without debate. The optimates were now firmly gripping the senatorial reins, driving toward a showdown. With Pompey as their hired sword, they believed they could isolate and vanquish Caesar once and for all. The Senate passed the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, along with resolutions of the harshest and most severe nature to end Caesar's command and suppress those distinguished officials, the tribunes of the people. As Caesar rode, fearing for themselves, Mark Antony and another tribune fled Rome, making their way north to join Caesar. Senatus Consultum Ultimum <coughs> Several days later, Caesar assembled his troops and recounted all the wrongs he believed had been perpetrated against him by the Senate oligarchs. They had, they had seduced Pompey, played on his pride, and turned him against Caesar. They had used armed force to abrogate the power of the people's tribunes. They had passed a harsh ultimum that normally was reserved for suppressing mutiny or violence, of which there had been neither. They had ordered Caesar to disband his army while Pompey continued to levy troops. Despite Caesar's overtures, Pompey would make no promise to treat with him. Caesar reiterated his offer. We shall both disband our armies. There shall be complete demobilization in Italy. The regime of terror shall cease. There shall be free elections in the Senate, and the Roman people shall be in full control of the government. By submitting our differences to mutual discussion, we shall settle them all. These proposals won the approval of his troops, but were again summarily, summarily, summar, summarily rejected by Pompey and the Optimates. Pompey, wrote Cicero approvingly, is quite contemptuous of anything Caesar can do and confident in his own in the Republic's forces. For Cicero, a negotiated settlement with Caesar offered nothing more than the dangers of a false peace. The choices Caesar now faced were attended with great danger. If he re-entered Italy with his legionaries, he would spark a civil war, the outcome of which loomed most uncertain. But were he to return without them, he would be powerless to pursue further reforms and risk being done in by the Optimates' assassins. At the very least, he would be prosecuted for vote-buying or treason or for having disregarded auspices and vetoes during his first consulship. The trial would be before a carefully selected, the trial would be before a carefully selected jury in a courtroom ring, ringed by Pompey's soldiers with a predictable outcome. Assured of the backing of his troops, Caesar struck camp and prepared to march south. On 10 January 49 BC, with only 300 cavalry and 5,000 infantry, the rest of his army was beyond the Alps. He crossed the Rubicon, a small river that separated Cisalpine Gaul from ancient Italy. To this day, as readers might recognize, to cross the Rubicon means to take an irrevocable step regarding an opposing issue. By moving troops onto Italian soil without permission of the Senate, Caesar was committing an act of treason. Civil war between Pompey and him was now inevitable. As Caesar made his way down the Italian peninsula, the local population began to swing over to his side. Writing a century after the events, Lucan, a sympathizer of the senatorial party, described Caesar as frantic for war. He would rather burst the city gate than find it open to admit him. He would rather ravage the land with fire and sword than overrun it without protest from the farmer. This was hardly so. Caesar always preferred to make allies of former enemies. In January 49, he eagerly welcomed the allegiance of Italian towns and garrisons as they threw open their gates to him. He vowed to rule without the cruelty and repression they had marked Sulla's reign, or that had marked Sulla's reign, declaring, Let this be the new style of conquest to make mercy and generosity our shield. He again called upon Pompey to prefer my friendship to that of those who have always been his and my bitter enemies, by whose machinations the country has been brought to its present impasse. And mid March 49, almost three months after he had entered Italy, as Balbus reports to Cicero, Caesar was still eager to restore good relations with Pompey. <clears throat> Cicero himself would have none of it. He continued to wail about Caesar's fiendish campaign, the planned debt cancellations, recall anti-Sulan exiles, and a hundred other villainies. 
I expect nothing but atrocities from him. That's what Cicero says. The flowery hypocrisy that Cicero long displayed toward Caesar came to full bloom by March 49. In a letter to Caesar, he professed friendship and offered to mediate the dispute with Pompey. And the very next day, he wrote to his friend Atticus of his distress regarding Caesar's impending victory. Sometime later, he bragged of his cunning, telling Atticus that a massive, that a missive he sent to Caesar contained no other material except flattery, with not a word about what I really believe. Most of the Italian countryside hailed Caesar. So, so too did the Roman proletariat in a far cry from the furiously hostile reception they had accorded the troops of the reactionary Sulla decades earlier. Within, within weeks, Caesar took Rome while Pompey and his forces retreated to Greece where they anticipated greater support. With both consuls and most of the Senate having fled, the People's Tribal Assembly judged that the Republic needed a legally constituted authority. It passed the law giving the praetor Lepidus, the right to nominate a temporary dictator in place of the absent consuls. As was expected by the people, Lepidus appointed Caesar Dio, says that Caesar committed no act of terror while dictator. Instead, he recalled the descendants of Sulla's proscription, allowing them to return to Rome with all their rights restored after over 30 years of exile. He also granted Roman citizenship, Roman citizenship to the Gauls, who lived south of the Alps just beyond the Po. The rest is ancient history. Caesar reigns his dictatorship, but now rules as council. No, no, Caesar resigns his dictatorship, but now rules as council. There follows more than four years of intermittent civil war, resulting in the defeat of Pompey's forces at Pharsalus, northern Greece, in 48. With Caesar in hot pursuit, a vanquished Pompey flees to Egypt. Ministers of young King Plotomy, wanting neither Pompey as a master nor Caesar as an enemy, kill him. Caesar arrives in Egypt. When presented with Pompey's head, he turns away with sorrow and loathing. Upon receiving Pompey's seal ring, he bursts into tears, and he puts two of Pompey's assassins to death. Caesar occupies Alexandria with a small force and is besieged by the king's troops. Bolstered by reinforcements that arrive in March 47, the Romans prove victorious. Caesar installs Cleopatra and her younger brother as co-regents of Egypt. Finding time to pursue a love affair with her that includes an extended cruise up the Nile from 48 to 44, Caesar rules Rome, sometimes from afar in a series of consulships that allows him to initiate wide-ranging reforms discussed in chapter 8. After the, after, the, uh, after the defeat of Pompey's son in Spain in March 45, peace is finally restored. Sometime in September or October 45, now at the height of his power, a triumphant Caesar returns to Rome, where he is showered with extravagant honors, including the title of Imperator per Perpetus. He has scarcely six months to live. So he goes to Alexandria. Uh, Pompey goes to Egypt, he's killed. <coughs> Ministers of young King Plotomy, excuse me, he's in Egypt, King Plotomy, Egypt. Uh, Caesar is, installs Cleopatra and her younger brother as co regents of Egypt. So Julius Caesar is fucking uh, Cleopatra. I want to read on Cleopatra for sure. I want to read a book about her. Anyway, y'all. Uh, that's the end of chapter six. <coughs> the face of Caesar. Peace.